Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. So, no uh, Today I'm going to present the hard life of uh, uh, securing a particle accelerator. I know it's a catchy name, and security at CERN is a hot topic and cover many, many aspects. Today we are most, mostly covering the identity and access management part. Uh, my name is Antonio Nappi. As you can understand from my accent, I'm Italian. I work at CERN since 2015. Um, I was in charge of moving, I mean, my role is to basically uh, provide infrastructure to host Java application, useful for the daily life of CERN. My role was to basically move this infrastructure from VMs to uh, Kubernetes. So I started really early to work with Kubernetes since uh, 2016. And previously I was uh, OpenStack and Python developer. And my name is Sebastian Wopiński. As you can perhaps guess from my, you know, letters in my name, I'm Polish. I work at CERN since 2001. Uh, now I'm the service manager of the single sign-on service. Uh, but for many, many years, I was doing computer security at CERN. So that's my kind of main uh, profile, I would say. And my background is software engineering. So perhaps it's a good moment to very briefly remind what CERN is, although perhaps hopefully uh, many of you do know. Uh, so it's a European laboratory for particle physics. So the slogan is accelerating science, but what, uh, what well, we, or rather what physicists really do, is they study the fundamental laws of nature uh, by doing uh, experiments with particles. Um, and this will be actually relevant to you know, the requirements uh, to our system, so I'm, that's why I'm covering it here. So we operate a number of particle accelerators, including the Large Hadron Collider, which is this huge machine. Um, you can see the ring here um, in the countryside around Geneva, Switzerland, but actually the accelerator is 100 meter underground. It's 27 kilometer long. So this is uh, where those huge machines, the uh, particle detectors, uh, they, which you can see here in the picture, they um, observe particle collisions and they observe perhaps new particles being created. And this is where in 2012 the Higgs boson was discovered. And this resulted in Nobel Prize uh, in physics in 2013. However, closer to our domain, CERN is also the place where the web was born in 1989. So Tim Berners-Lee, who you can see here in the picture, he you know, designed or invented the HTTP protocol, HTML language, you know, implemented the first browser. Uh, and well, bro well, it wasn't called browser at that time. And certainly the first HTTP server. So there is also some computing part to, to CERN, certainly. What is also relevant is uh, it's really an international organization with uh, over 15,000 uh, scientists from all around the world uh, working together in this logic of you know, peaceful uh, collaboration for science. It's fundamental science, so we don't do applied science, we don't do research on you know, nuclear uh, energy or, or weapons. It's really fundamental science. With nationalities, with people coming from all possible nationalities. And again, this will matter in a moment. So as you could see from our presentation, uh, I, uh, my, myself and Sebastian, we have a different background. He's more focused on the part of security and key clock application. We are more focused on the, on the um, infrastructure and deployment of key clock. So we are going to cover this uh, in two parts. So Sebastian will start with the key clock specific uh, part, and then I will focus on the part of deployment infrastructure. All right. So. I don't think I need to convince anyone in 2024 why having a centralized single sign-on service in an organization makes sense. So I will not cover all the details, but just to mention that this is one of the unique cases where you can achieve usability, security, and cost efficiency at the same time. So obviously, single sign-on is the way to have uh, to provide author authentication and perhaps authorization to different resources in a big distributed organization. So what we use at CERN uh, is Keyclock software. Now, just to have an understanding, how many of you, if you could raise your hands, if you are at least somehow familiar with Keycloak? All right, excellent. So most of you, which is very good, which means you're in a good room. That's, that's great. So I'll not cover too many details. But for those who maybe are less familiar, it's the open source identity and access management solution. It provides single sign-on with support of uh, you know, multi-factor uh, authentication or second-factor authentication. It could be OTP, uh, some one-time passwords. It could be WebAuthn uh, tokens and with role-based author authorization. It allows for user federation with uh, you know, Active Directory or LDAP or Kerberos servers. 
Uh, it supports external identity providers uh, so that people could log in with in different organization and still have a session in CERN SSO, in our case. Uh, it supports social login, so people can log in with their you know, Google or, or, or LinkedIn accounts. And what is very important is that it uses, uh, it's built on standard authentication uh, protocols, well, the modern ones such as OAuth2 or OIDC, Open ID Connect, or maybe not so modern as SAML. I'm not a great fan, but anyway. Uh, and okay, we're here, and obviously I think you know this, because Kicklock since uh, spring last year is in uh, CNCF incubation. So maybe I should uh, mention briefly why uh, CERN has gone for, you know, first of all, on-prem, uh, you know, single sign-on service and not in the cloud as an organization. Why did we go for open source and why have we chosen Kicklock? Uh, so I mentioned that we operate, you know, particle accelerators and, ex and experiments. So all this technical infrastructure must not be interrupted uh, and computing systems that support it, including single sign-on, they may re must really work uh, while, while, the while the machine is turning which means that we really need to have full control over configuration um, of the system, but also over release and patching cycle uh, of, of including single sign-on service. Uh, and we need the service to be available from our internal um, industrial control systems network, which is a private network with non-routable IP addresses. So they couldn't, you know, machines on that network could not go uh, to the cloud. Uh, well, we value openness, uh, you know, open source is really compatible with CERN's uh, initiatives such as, you know, open science, open access. Uh, I would say open source is really in our DNA. And we really wanted to avoid vendor lock-in. And equally importantly, to avoid the situation where uh, we didn't want to be subject to, you know, sanctions or export laws. We, we may have, I know, uh, scientists from Iran. We want them to be able to, be able to authenticate to our services regardless of what may be decided for good or bad reasons, you know, by, by some politicians somewhere. Um, so this is important for us. And then Kicklock really fits our needs. It has a lot of big adopters, which proves it works at scale. A very uh, nice growing usage in academia and research. Uh, very strong user base, actively developed with many frequent releases. Uh, it is extensible which I will mention later how we use that possibility, so it can be adapted to our needs. So we use Kicklock, uh, actually not me personally, but we uh, started with Kicklock in 2018 with Kicklock 4. You may know that uh, these days the recent release of Kicklock is 24, so we really started very early on. So this is how the service looks like uh, right now. We have 200,000 users, including external people who connect to CERN for whatever reasons. Uh, that's a lot, but that's perhaps not, huge num not a huge number. We have 10,000 OIDC clients, which is mostly web applications, but in Keycloak and OIDC standard, uh, standard is, you say, clients. Uh, and that's a lot. Normally, organizations don't have so many you know, applications behind their single sign-on. Well, this is because at CERN, everyone and their dog can set up a website and put it behind single sign-on. So that's what it is. And we have uh, 10,000 uh, logins per hour during uh, office hours, so you can see it on the right. For those of you, especially in the back row, which you, if you cannot see the, the shape, just to explain to you, it's actually, uh, I don't know what you think, but it is basically uh, logins in the morning and in the afternoon with the break for the lunch. All right. Uh, so this, the, the service, um, our service, again, based on Keycloak, so it's used, really using Keycloak features, is uh, offering, of course, two-factor authentication with time-based one-time passwords or web authentic tokens, which could be hardware tokens or, you know, biometric the devices, fingerprint readers, and so on. Uh, Kerberos authentication, it offers uh, uh, integration with Edugain, which is this um, educational identity federation, and it means that actually people can log in to CERN uh, or have a session that's in CERN single sign-on by logging in at their university with their university credentials, right? And then have a session at single sign-on at CERN. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're authorized to do anything yet, but at least they, they can connect and perhaps be given um, you know, privileges that they need. All right, and we have also support social logins, Google, Facebook, GitHub, and LinkedIn, and guest accounts, which means if someone comes and needs to log into a CERN system and doesn't have any of the previously mentioned, you know, 
identities, they can just create a local identity with an external email address. Um, so our single sign-on is tightly integrated with what we call CERN authorization service. I will not go into details, so you know, the diagram on the right is not readable on purpose, it's just to show that it's a complex beast. Um, so it's, uh, it's a service that uh, manages identities and accounts, applications and their authorization, so you know, roles, level of assurance and so on, and some uh, 80,000 groups. And now, the decision back in 2018 was to implement this outside of Keycloak for various reasons, which perhaps I will mention here. Uh, well, you know, we at CERN have some complex use cases which sometimes necessitates that we develop our own you know, solutions around them. And at that time, 2018, uh, Keycloak was still less, well, much less mature than now, and some of the capabilities were limited. And we also wanted to have this uh, possibility to switch from Keycloak to another solution. We didn't use that possibility, and I don't think we will use it now. Uh, you will see that we're very happy with Keycloak, but however, this was the decision taken at the time. Now, it's important to mention that Keycloak does provide support for pretty much most, if not all, of those, uh, those features. Maybe not exactly the way we would use them, but still. So perhaps if we had to take the decision now, the decision perhaps would have been to just use Keycloak's features uh, right away. All right, so I mentioned uh, the extensions that we do, uh, we put into Keycloak um, so that it does some specific things that we, what we want. So there is, we, uh, and this is using so-called uh, service provider interface, so SPIs, so we can provide our providers into, that run within Keycloak. Uh, so part of this is to do integration with this CERN authorization service that I mentioned before. Uh, which manages authorization and which create, cr also creates identities for external accounts if they log in to CERN for the first time. Uh, we, of course, have our own CERN team uh, so that, you know, the login pages for the users, they have uh, CERN look and, uh, look and feel, which is kind of normal, obvious. But also tiny but nice thing that I, I like is that we develop this um, uh, provider for the admin, ad, admin console team so that depending to which environment you connect, you have a different color of the banner. And this is very simple. This is just to avoid that we do something, change something in production while we think we're connected to, the, to dev because we have so many tabs open. So it's stupid. It works. When I see red banner, I don't click anymore. It really works. All right, and a few of the extensions that we um, develop, which actually may be, which are not CERN specific and which can be useful perhaps for other people. Uh, so one of them is OTP validation endpoint. So it's the endpoint that confirms if a given OTP, a one-time password code, you know, this six-digit code, is currently valid, valid for a given user. So why would we expose this? Well, because this is used by our custom PAM module in SSH servers to enforce 2FA on SSH access to sensitive machines, you know, bastion hosts and so on. So that's how it works. Uh, which also means that we have the same OTP for web access and SSH access. We also have a provider to detect compromised passwords. So how it works is that when a user logs in, of course, we don't clear, keep clear text passwords anywhere, obviously. Uh, but when the user logs in, uh, the password is hashed and then compared against uh, a list of known compromised passwords. We have this huge database uh, that comes from, you know, have I been pwned, so uh, Troy Hunt, and, you know, many other security sources. So we can detect if a password was compromised somewhere and it appears on some list. And we have our own uh, CERN CAPTCHA, which is used when uh, guest accounts are being created. <coughs> and this, it replaces uh, the default Google reCAPTCHA, uh, which we do for privacy reasons and also for availability reasons, so that people could register their guest accounts from countries where Google is perhaps blocked or not available. All right. So, you know, of course, uh, any big piece of software uh, that you use, if you start using it, uh, you know, seriously, you hit some, some small limits and, and, and uh, there are some challenges. Uh, let me mention some of them. Uh, there are obviously, you know, minor inconsistencies, limitations and bug. A few examples is we very recently discovered uh, that when we edit in Keycloak, a user that is blocked already temporarily perhaps in Active Directory, then editing the user blocks, the, sorry, blocks it in the Keycloak database, which means if the user is then 
unblocked in Active Directory, the user is still blocked in Keycloak and cannot log in. So I think there is something strange here. We haven't really reported it yet, but it's a very fresh finding. But you know, sometimes you find uh, things that, you know, in some corner cases that hit us. You know, there are some small inconsistencies in logs, so log messages, maybe the username doesn't appear in the log message, but the user ID appears, or maybe the username appears, but in the, in the user ID field. So sometimes, you know, it's, it's inconsistent and requires special parsing of the logs. Uh, another thing is admin console, uh, which actually provides different features and different information depending which team you choose for the admin console, which is kind of strange and, again, not expected. Um, okay, then, uh, you know, major versions uh, when we upgrade, they obviously occasionally bring uh, breaking changes, including sometimes unexpected breaking changes. When we migrated from uh, Keycloak 19 to 20, OpenID scope became mandatory in requests to the user ID endpoint. So this is, was to make it com uh, standard compliant, which makes perfect sense, except that some clients were not standard compliant and were not including that uh, open ID scope in their requests, and all of, the, all of a sudden things started breaking. So they costed uh, some research. Um, you know, some features uh, stay in pre preview mode for a long time, uh, so one of them is this uh, token exchange support, which was mentioned yesterday at this very nice presentation in the morning. Some of you may have attended it. Uh, so it works very well. We use it actually a lot. Uh, but it's in preview, so should we trust it? Will it change? Uh, so if you go to even Keycloak Discourse Forum, people ask about this regularly. There's actually each link is a different uh, discourse thread when people ask every year different people, will it stay in preview mode? What are the plans? So it's a bit sometimes frustrating a little bit. However, and I'm very happy to say that uh, in, you know, just two months ago, uh, Thomas, one of the maintainers, who is perhaps even in this room, I don't know, right, I'm not sure, uh, he published uh, actually plans, uh, so one of the Kiktok maintainers published plans to move uh, this feature out of preview, which is, which is great news, so thanks and very appreciated. And this is also to show that things change and things get really better from re re one release to another. All right, one last thing I want to mention is that, you know, since we manage, and I think by default you manage Keycloak with the admin console, so web UI, you know, it's great, but uh, it comes with drawbacks. You know, there is no versioning of the configuration, there is no change detection, there is limited, limited traceability. You know, who changed what if you have several admins? You, well, you can find it in the logs eventually, but you know. Uh, this is what it is. Uh, how we deal with it is that we have our custom solution to basically regularly dump um, configuration, so Realm exports, Realm and other settings, uh, manipulate a little bit the JSON so that the fields and objects are sorted, so that they're comparable, and then push it to Git, which means whenever there is a change, there is a new commit, so we can track what has changed in our configuration. If you manage Kitlock, I really recommend this approach. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay, uh, this, as you can maybe understand, the sen, uh, single sign-on is a, probably the most critical services in IT department and in the world CERN. The reason is that it's not only used for the daily life of CERN, so even to access any application, administration, financial, engineering, you need to log in, but also experiment were using it for data taking. This means that if the accelerator runs and some of their tools that are monitoring the accelerator, the data that is taken from the collision, they don't have access to the single sign-on, that's a problem. So, uh, back to the 2022, I think, November, end of that year, um, we were asked, my team, uh, to, to review the infrastructure of the single sign-on because there were some issue of the, basically, with, with the performance. This is, I, I put here how, basically, it was deployed at that time. You can, you can see that basically everything was managed on VMs with Puppet. So there was a, a, a layer of front end where there were basically two machines, uh, one, proc uh, one HA proxy, one active and one passive. Uh, the switch between the two was almost taking 15 minutes. This means that if the active machine was going down, the, there was 10, 15 minutes where basically the, the key clock itself was not giving any, any, any error. I mean, any, any uh, page. 
Then in the, uh, this was the front end from the key clock backend servers where you, you, we had multiple VMs in multiple availability zones where all the key clock uh, um, processes were running together with InfiniSpan. This means that all the operations were much more difficult when, for example, uh, the SSO team had to change the SPI, they had to be really careful to not lose the uh, user session. And as, as well, I mean, as I said, everything was man maintained by Puppet, and actually there was probably only one maintainer at that time that was constantly update the Puppet module to the new version of, uh, of Keyclock. So uh, we decided then to look at this and to propose an alternative architecture. Uh, the choice was quite easy. Uh, we decided to move everything to Kubernetes. The reason, I mean, Probably if you are, you, you are already aware why we should move to Kubernetes, but this was not so obvious in our department and to some of the management. So we had really to demonstrate that, that moving to, to Kubernetes was a good choice. So the first thing is, is that key clock direction was clear. The JBoss, that is, was the application server that was hosting the key clock application, was basically replaced by Quarkus, that is a Java framework designed for Kubernetes. And then also they were providing Kubernetes operator for deployment. That was making things much, much easier. Plus, you get, with all the advantages of Kubernetes, the key clock itself become much more portable. Now we can move across multiple clouds, on-premise, uh, public cloud, without any problem, because we use Kubernetes as platform of deployment. And then, of course, it's reproducible and mutable. This helps a lot to speed up operation and reduce the team effort. Because, because, because before, a lot of effort was done, was, was basically to maintain this infrastructure up and running, more than actually focus on needs of the uh, end user of uh, Keyclock. And then, this makes, of course, much easier to maintain the infrastructure in long term because we have a, a vibrant uh, uh, community around Kubernetes and Keyclock, while for the, uh, for the Puppet world was basically one guy that was dedicating his time to, to a Puppet module, that any time he could just decide maybe to move as well to, to Kubernetes or something else. So this is how it looks like now. Um, the big change is that Git becomes the source of truth. So we have all the part of logging, monitoring, Keyclock operator, uh, Keyclock configuration of the CRD in Git. And then there is Argo CD that automatically synchronizes this in multiple clusters. I'm uh, a huge fan of the uh, Kubernetes cattle uh, service model. That maybe is not nice for, for cattle, but uh, uh, the idea is that basically all the Keyclock are running multi in different Kubernetes clusters. Uh, each of these Kubernetes clusters is a different availability zone. And basically, um, we also decide to split the key clock from InfiniSpan. The reason I will explain a bit more later and watch which, uh, which are the advantages. But basically, this was a, a good change for us. And, but we kept the InfiniSpan actually on VMs. Actually, not uh, uh, fully on VMs. We use still Puppet, but only to spawn up Podman. So basically, InfiniSpan is a container running in Podman, and Puppet is only used to configure the, the, the Podman, and that's it. And ah, last, last piece, but is going to be here. Uh, basically, as I said, yes, there is an InfiniSpan cluster dedicated. And plus, we replace also the load balancer, uh, where basically we have now a, a, a cluster of three machines where we use floating IP. And basically, every time the active machine goes down, the IP is moved to another passive, passive one of the passive nodes. And this is almost uh, uh, invisible to end users. So the, the, the failover is, is almost, so we don't have basically downtime for, for that. And then, well, I don't go too much in detail here because it will take too much time, but basically we started to update also all the monitoring and logging part. We replaced the Flume-based logging part with Fluent Bit, and we had to rewrite all the parsing and so on, and then also started to adopt Prometheus. It was already partially used, but this was fully put in containers. Now, um, as I said, we had to demonstrate that this move was actually worth it, because we had to spend some uh, resources. I mean, the team at Senna is extremely small, and sometimes people don't see a reason to change if something works. Uh, even if there is a, a clear gain, this is not always obvious. Uh, so we wanted to demonstrate that since we were adding a new virtualization layer, that is Kubernetes, we were actually not losing any performance. And so basically what we did, we upgrade to, to version 20 of Keyclock and start to stress test. Basically, we use this closed uh, workload model 
where uh, the number of user, uh, there is a number of users, in this case uh, 50, uh, 50 concurrent users, were executing the same scenario multiple times. This means that um, more requests your server is able to handle, more requests will come to your server. And this runs for 10 minutes. If you can, as you can see probably from, from the screen, is that the new infrastructure, based on Kubernetes and the separation of uh, Keyclock from InfiniSpan, was uh, four times more efficient than the previous one. And we were able to end much more uh, requests than, than the before. This was kind of uh, a way to get the green light from management to go forward. And uh, now I want to actually focus on the split InfiniSpan and Keyclock. This is, I think this was the really, real, real, real uh, breakthrough uh, of the infrastructure. Why we decided to do that? I think, well, first, because of experience with Java application. In, we, as a team, we have a lot of experience with Java application, with caching, and we always prefer the model of having the cache separate from the application. That sometimes has its own sense. But in our, in this case, we demonstrate that was not extremely uh, useful. F plus, infinite span and key clock, they scale differently. Key clock can be almost stateless. It can scale from zero to whatever. While InfiniSpan, depending on how much times you uh, replicate a cache, it, it, it has some performance issues. So if you go through a, a, a certain threshold, you start to have uh, some performance uh, losses. So, and also, I mean, one question that happened, I remember there was an issue about uh, Keyclock. They asked what actually was the component that was failing, InfiniSpan or, uh, or Keyclock? In the previous model on VMs, since they were sharing the same Java process, it was almost impossible to understand what, which process was using uh, more CPU or more memory. Splitting them, now we have a more clear view of what is going on. So we know that which is CPU intensity, what is uh, memory intensity. Of course, this simplifies a lot of operation because it makes Keyclock stateless. Uh, now, if you need to upgrade a uh, SPI, for example, uh, the, the, the team or whatever, you just need, need to restart quickly the, the, the the pod key clock, and this is is almost invisible to end users because they don't even realize they don't lose session because this is infinite span. Uh, while before it was still possible, but you had to uh, have a much more coordination because you had to start first the first node, waiting that was going up, then uh, waiting that the, the cache was replicated to another node, and so on. Uh, so it was taking, the operation were taking much longer. While now is just you kill the pod. It's up in 40, in 40 seconds, and that's it, and you are happy, and no one see anything. Actually, I tell you, I remember that when uh, the first week we moved to Kubernetes, we had some issue with the Java settings that were too low. And so basically for three days, all the pods were restarting every three hours at different time, but there was no complaint. And I mean, this is a, a, a service that is fully utilized every, basically, day, because of course we have people at CERN that work from 8 to 6 p.m., but there are also people in the States, in the Asia, that are connecting through the San SSO at any time, even in the night. So this is a, a, a service that has to be always up. How we did that, that I mean, this is now actually uh, fully documented in the key clock uh, documentation. But when I, I look at that, I think it was, yes, beginning of 23, I remember there was no clear way to do that. It was possible. I had to dig a lot in GitHub issue to find some example, people that were trying the same, but it was not uh, well documented. Actually, this was, I think, a recent update, maybe with multi-site uh, setup. Uh, so basically, what we did, we just created the config map out of an um, InfiniSpan configuration where we specify a remote server. We use this, uh, we set up the InfiniSpan cluster with uh, um, a DNS uh, uh, alias, so basically, the three IPs are behind the DNS, and then basically we tell to Keyclock to, to go there. Uh, and then we mount this file in the Keyclock through volume and volume ones are like any Kubernetes uh, resource. And then we specify through this uh, cache config file option uh, where Keyclock should look for this config file. Now, uh, we moved Keyclock to Kubernetes in September 2023. So it's uh, more than actually six months. We are going for the seventh month. And I mean, think I want to highlight here the good things of this move. Uh, first of all, is operation, as probably you all know. Make all the operation much faster and easier. Uh, there is less time spent in coordinating because you need to be careful to infinite span. You can restart key clock without any problem. And then we introduced the GitOps approach 
that allows us, I mean, if you remember what, I mean, what just said uh, Sebastian about, there is no really way to track in changes. Still, there are pieces that are in the database and they are not easily to, 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 to track. But all the other changes that in there, the CRD, they are easily, uh, and also Docker images, they are easily uh, tracked by Git because basically uh, there is someone, there is a merge request, someone has to review it and so on. Uh, and if you see any problem, you can just refer to the previous commit. Uh, we, we demonstrated that this infrastructure was much, much more reliable, reliable than, than, than the past. In the last six months, we never had any issue, while before it was happening a bit more often. Um, and this is a redundant architecture as well. So it's even as more resources than the past that uh, is kind of required because, I mean, all these clustering in different uh, availability zones. And also, I mean, we know that now the time that we are spending on the operation and on the uh, infrastructure is much less than it was before. Before it was basically hijacking uh, the, 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 the time of the SSO uh, team. Now it's basically just a small fraction that they have to do from time to time, for example, like upgrade key clock or things like that. Uh, less good things. Uh, you know, when I went to manage and present, look, we use uh, CRD Kubernetes, and then I showed them there is unsupported field. has been there for, for many years. It's extremely useful, uh, but maybe, uh, I mean, to justify, it, so people are a bit scared when they see things. Why there is unsupported in something that is running in production? Uh, is it some hard to explain? Uh, infinite finding VMs. We want to move them as well to, to Kubernetes. The, 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 the main issue is that usually multi-cluster approach with stateful, they are not uh, best friends. Uh, we have some luck in terms of uh, service mesh, so we are looking at that to, to see how we can achieve that. And then, probably this is a bit provocative, is there an alternative cache to InfiniSpan? Keyclock is part of CNCF, but InfiniSpan that is basically required to run is not. So what is the future of that? Our plans, I think we are almost at the end. Um, we want to prepare a BCDR plan, so a business continuity disaster recovery plan, because this is what uh, okay. we were asked. I mean, as I said, this is an extremely critical service. If it goes down, the whole certain activities will be basically stopped, and this is not uh, reasonable. We want to investigate service mesh uh, for infinite span deployment. So probably something like Cilium to basically be able to run multiple instances on the, on the, of uh, infinite span in multiple cluster. Or even to look, I think, this uh, test multi-site uh, deployment that was recently uh, advertised in the Keyclock blog. So this is something that we, we will see in the next year. I leave the, I leave the floor for the Keyclock part. Thanks. Uh, and the other parts of our plans is to define, uh, you know, how we upgrade uh, how, and how we keep upgrading Keycloak, so how much we want to be far away from the mainstream uh, most recent release. Um, you know, do we want to apply all the minor versions that appear? You see that, you know, they, have, they tend to appear, uh, well, in that very particular case, 2401 appear just one day after 2400. I guess we would never anyway go with production for the 00, zero um, new my, my, you know, major release, but still to, to, we have to get a feeling how often and how we should upgrade. Uh, we certainly want to contribute back to Keycloak. Uh, we kind of very slowly started, uh, but I think uh, the community deserves more, so whatever we develop internally, if it's usable, we will want to contribute back. And uh, perhaps actually reassess uh, whether we should uh, be using or using more Keycloak's so-called authorization service, which I haven't really mentioned much, but uh, well, because this is what we currently have implemented outside of Keycloak. But perhaps we should just use what Keycloak provides. All right, and this uh, brings us to the last word and last slide. Uh, and there are actually two very simple messages. We are very happy with Keycloak. It's a great software with, uh, with strong community behind. So uh, we absolutely have pl no plans to change. We will uh, use it uh, and happily grow with uh, and see how Kiklo grows. And we are very happy with the move to Kubernetes hosting. It's obviously the mainstream ap supported approach to host uh, Keycloak. Uh, it is, gives us much more reliable infrastructure, as Antonio mentioned before. Uh, it makes, again, uh, easy to test and deploy changes. It's just the way to do it. All right, and with this, we Thank you very much for your attention. Thank and you. Any questions? I think we have one minute for questions, if you have any. Uh, otherwise, you, we can just uh, There are microphones outside. in the middle of the Maybe. corridor. Yeah, there is a microphone in the, in the middle of the corridor.
Um, so, I, do, I only have one question. How do you deal with like security events um, when it comes to Keycloak? So, for example, you get a failed user login and it happens like 60 times uh, in an hour. Uh, do you actually monitor for that? So, uh, the question is, you know, if, how, if and how we deal with security events with users, like when users perhaps get compromised or when we see um, some suspicious activities, uh, we, this is more uh, done by the computer security team, which I used to be a member of for, for 15 years. There are various mechanisms in place, it's a separate discussion, but uh, basically they do analyze uh, the logs that, login logs that comes from Keycloak for various aspects, including, for example, connections from unknown or, let's say, suspicious or unknown locations. So, for example, if, if I connected from the train to, to, uh, to Paris or if I connected from a hotel, I got a message, uh, you know, some minutes later on saying, you've connected for a location that you didn't do before. Is it you? If not, please, please let us know. Please report. And there are other mechanisms. I I, if I just may add as well, we have a, a system to detect. Sometimes they are not uh, only compromised users. There are also some users that are testing Keycloak uh, integration, and they start hammering the service. It means that people they do 10,000 login in t less than 10 minutes. That is not reason reasonable, and we monitor as well that. And we try. Well, we don't have a really policy. We at the moment contact the user and say, please, can you stop this and and uh, figure out what is going on. But we would like to have some more autonomous to react and um, deny this, this, this kind of users if they start wandering the service. So thanks for the question. Thank you have a question. So uh, since you decided to split InfiniSpan uh, from Kitlock uh, and running a separate service, why InfiniSpan and not Redis Cache, for example? Why InfiniSpan uh, instead of Redis Cache, for example? Well, uh, we cannot use Redis because uh, Keycloak only supports uh, InfiniSpan as first cache. So that's actually the, 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 my provocative message is why we cannot support multiple uh, cache systems. So that's... Uh... Okay. Right, well, thank you all for... Um, for you have a, Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, did you consider using infrastructure as code tooling like Terraform to track changes instead of exporting JSONs? And why did you not use it, if yes? Uh, I think that he was using most, I mean, uh, I think what Sebastian mentioned was more related to Realm import, because I think when we started, the Realm import was not part of the ETOPS. We actually discussed this yesterday, and I think we, were, we need to align on that, because Ola, um, when we did this, there was this change between the old Keycloak operator to the new one, and the Realm import was removed from the GitOps part. Now, instead, I see recently in the new versions, actually the Realm can be part of the, uh, of the CRD. So probably, well, uh, this it may be something to one. discuss. We will look at that. I don't usually like Terraform because there is not this concept of reconciliation. So basically, you push something, but then you... D <laughs> well. That's, I, mean, <laughs> I said some, so that's why. So we usually prefer the GitOps, so, because we are not sure that all the time is reconciled. So definitely something that we are gonna look. Actually, I think it would be nice to have even more configuration in Git than actually in the database. But well, this I guess is gonna be a difficult task uh, for the future. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Are there any other questions? In any case, we'll, we're going to stay in this room for certainly some minutes more. We're very, we welcome you very much to uh, approach us directly if you have more things to discuss or if you have other experiences to share because we also want to learn from other Keycloak users. And there are, I guess there are many here. So thanks.